Thank you, Chairman Uzun. I would like to recognize the Deputy Defense Minister and the, Your Excellency's Ambassadors, Tan, Ricciardioni, Jeffries, and Armitage. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to address you here. My late father was a doctor in Izmir, and uh, my late mother was a 1936 graduate of Izmir American Girls College. There were only eight girls in his class during that year. I'm a Robert Academy graduate. My wife, Aishan, who is with me today, is a graduate of Yuskidar American Girls College. My son is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon and has an MBA from Harvard Business School. And my daughter is a graduate of Duke University and has an MBA from Stanford. So you can say that we're all US educated. <laughs> I left Turkey with $1,000 exactly 49 years ago that my father gave me. And when I ended up in Corvallis, Oregon, I had $100 left. And after all, I had to work my way through school. Actually, Oregon State students embarrassed me, embraced me, and I was elected president of the student body in a university with 14,000 students. That's when I realized that the concept of the American dream was all real, and that if you set your targets right, and if you worked hard, you can accomplish just anything and everything you strived for. I went to the school in the United States for six years, worked for three years, then I came back to Turkey. I had a couple of interesting surprises in the United States though. One was when I arrived at Harvard Business School, after driving from Oregon to Harvard Business School, and moved into my dormitory in Gallatin Hall, across from George F. Baker Library on the campus, and started going to classes. On the third day, the admissions office called me and asked me if I, was a, if I were a US citizen or if I had a green card. I gave the answer no to both of these questions. And they said, Mr. Ezeen, sorry, you know, we can lend you your tuition money to go to school here. I said, what do I do now? Is there a solution to this? They said, yes, you can find an American citizen who would guarantee your loans to the school. That's when I, I had only one person in mind, and that was uh, Mr. Kenneth Litchfield, the, uh, what I, I called him my American father because I'd lived with them. I spent quite a time with them in Newport, Oregon before starting school and after starting school because I had become a visitor to them with American in, uh, in Experiment in International Living Program. And he basically, told Harvard Business School that they can lend me as much as they wanted and he would guarantee it. The second surprise was I started working for Arthur D. Little after I graduated and Arthur D. Little asked me if I'd go to Canada to, with a team that would advise international harvester in Canada in their cost cutting program. I said, yes, of course I would, if this is an assignment, but I said, my passport, has, my Turkish passport had expired, and the Turkish embassy would not extend that because I had to go back to Turkey and do my military service. Those were the rules at that time. But Arthur D. Little actually provided me with a green card at a record speed of two weeks. And I went to 
Canada. I worked there for four months with, my, with our team. Came back to my apartment in Somerville, Massachusetts, and I was surprised to get a little notice from local drafts board number 22. <laughs> I'm talking about the year 1969. So I was very fortunate because I had a very smart roommate and he told me to take my contact lenses off <laughs> when I went to the draft board and I, I failed the eye test <laughs> and therefore I continued on my job. But I was just wondering what my mom would have done if I had sent her a card from Saigon. <laughs> I and my family are probably one of the most fortunate people in the world because we never dreamt of my founding a bank with $8 million capital and then selling it for $6 billion 19 years later or employ 50,000 employees in 10 different countries during my entrepreneurial career or have companies actually incorporated in 10 different countries. I and my family also never dreamt that uh, our family foundation would build 45 primary and high schools where 30,000 students are studying right now, or that we would be able to build 25 girls' dormitories where 5,000 girls are continuing their junior and senior high school because they would not have been able to do so in their small villages or towns. I also, and my wife and my children also, would, never, would have never dreamt that our foundation would one day found a brand new university in Turkey where we plan to have 3,000 students, graduate and undergraduate, this fall on a 150,000 square meter campus in Istanbul. And my wife Aisha and I know that when she founded her Mother and Children Education Foundation in 1993, that within 19 years that she and her tremendous team will have trained 750,000 underprivileged mothers and their preschool children for a head start because these families obviously do not have the financial means to send their children to kindergartens. And she's done this in 81 different provinces throughout Turkey. I and all members of my family are grateful and thankful for being able to do these things. I would like to touch a little bit upon also Turkish-American relationships. With Turkish graduate students ranking number three in the United States and undergraduate students ranking number seven in the U.S. higher educational system, I think that Turkey and the United States should do better in their trade relationships. The uh, Turkey and the United States have had so many years of good relationships that that's especially enforced by Turkey's entering the NATO, as we all know. And Turkey participating in the Korean War, war with the American military. It's interesting to note that our relationships are not at the top of the agenda. Since I'm attending the ATC meetings for the first time, I find it to be more appropriate to raise some issues or questions instead of providing answers as to why Turkey and the United States are not more successful partners in trade relationships. First of all, I'd like to question whether why Turkey did not buy its first nuclear power plant from the United States 
but we bought this power plant from Russian Federation. It seems a little bit odd to me. Was it the structure of the tender, or was it the fact that this nuclear power plant was purchased on the basis of build, operate, transfer, and the potential U.S. suppliers could not find the financing for a structure like this? What surprises me also is that the Turkish government is going after the second nuclear power plant and talking to the South Koreans, the Japanese, until the Fujikama crisis. And as, as of a month ago, our prime minister also discussed the nuclear power plant issue with the Chinese when we were visiting Beijing and Shanghai. So another question, because we were not buying this plant actually from, from America or Canada, we have 300 engineers right now actually trying to learn Russian in Russian universities. Not too many Turkish students know Russian, so they have to go through this right now. Also, another question I have is that, I mean, U.S. economy in the size of $14 trillion is still a little bit less than the Chinese economy, which is about six and a half, seven billion dollars, plus Japanese economy and the German economy, all added up. So actually, it would be very normal for U.S.-Turkish trade relationship to be number one in the world, looking at it from the Turkish side. However, we see that Germany is number one with $36 billion of imports and exports in 2011. Russia is number two with $30 billion, I'll bite a lot of that is because of the $18 billion energy imports in the form of gas. And China is number three with $24 billion. And it's interesting that there is more momentum in Turkish-Russia relationships and in Turkish-Chinese relationships than I see in Turkish-American trade relationships. Because I'm the chairman of the business uh, Turkish-Chinese Business Council, and, and, and I see this in the sense that uh, when our prime ministers met Turkish and Chinese prime ministers about a year ago in Istanbul, they, they were, at that time, we're doing about $15 billion between China and Turkey in the previous year. And they basically set a target of reaching $50 billion in 2015. And as I see that most of the energy projects in Turkey right now are actually being done by the Chinese. I'm talking about the turbines for coal power plants, as well as small hydroelectric plants, are actually provided by the Chinese. And so is the construction of the fast train between Istanbul and Ankara. So the Chinese are no longer selling just T-shirts and toys to Turkey or to the rest of the world. They're actually selling what I would call high value added products. Not planes yet, but you will see that they'll be selling planes just like the Brazilians within the next three or four years. In fact, the Chinese plane, which is a regional plane, as you may know, which seats 79 passengers, is already on trial runs. And some of the Chinese wind power manufacturers have been visiting our company because we're involved in renewable energy, primarily operating with wind, and they're cutting prices by 20% of what GE in the United States or Vestas and uh, Gamesa, some of the European manufacturers, are quoting already. These are just a few examples that our relationships with the United States should not stagnate, and we all have a duty to rekindle this. And I also see, of course, that, for instance, we're in, our group is also involved in clothing retailing, 
and we've been franchisee of Marks and Spencer for the last 12 years. Now we're a franchisee of Gap, Banana Republic, and more recently of the brand Aeropostal. But the European companies like Marks and Spencer, Zara, came to Turkey six, seven years before the American brands. The American brands started coming to Turkey after the online part of their business started growing. In other words, after they started closing some of their shops and they came to Turkey after that. So what I'm really saying is uh, United States firms also have to be more aggressive in their penetration into the international markets, uh, not only for offensive reasons, but also for defensive reasons. I want to thank for the opportunity to address you today, and I hope I raised a few questions that will be challenging for your next, uh, for your uh, following meetings, and I very much appreciate being with you, and I wish success in the following meetings of ATC here, and I hope that this will contribute to the growth of our relationships, which we all want to happen. Stay here or not?